Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carolina Public Humanities. I want to welcome you to this Adventures and Ideas seminar, which is part of our continuing uh, series of webinars, which uh, we are now launching for the spring semester. This is, in fact, our first spring semester four-part Zoom webinar. And our program today is called Escape, Imaginary Lands and Magical Reality. And this seminar grows out of our recognition that uh, our desires for travel and escape have been blocked by the COVID pandemic. We're all sort of hemmed in and we're uh, surrounded by difficult news and challenging events. So in this situation, we wanted to reflect on what escapism and fantasy and fiction and film and other explorations of imaginary places might actually mean. I am Lloyd Kramer. I'm a professor in the history department at UNC Chapel Hill and also the director of Carolina Public Humanities. And it's, it's my pleasure to serve as the host of this event. We're going to have two talks and conversations this evening with my UNC colleagues, uh, Brian Sturm and Eliza Rose. And we'll continue the program tomorrow with a presentation by the film scholar, Rachel Shavitz. And Rachel will be joining us from New Zealand but she is known to many of you as one of our former colleagues here at Carolina Public Humanities. And then we'll conclude this seminar tomorrow evening with a panel discussion with all of the speakers. And this is going to follow the format we always use at our CPH events with some questions and answers and conversation. So we remain dependent on good internet technology for this seminar. And we hope that all of you will be able to maintain good internet connections throughout this event. Uh, you are scattered in many different places, but I'm thinking of you as one humanities community that is gathered in a shared space for this discussion of literature and film. I'm actually coming to you from the office of Carolina Public Humanities in Chapel Hill, but we're able to convene this seminar because of the technical skills of Paul Bonici. Paul does a fantastic job in managing the technological complexities of our CPH webinars and Zoom events. He also is a very active leader of our Carolina K-12 program. So I wanna begin with a, with a shout out to Paul Bonici. You won't be able to turn on your own cameras and audio functions during this seminar, but you can send questions and comments to us throughout the seminar today and tomorrow by using the Q&A tab on your Zoom uh, screen at the bottom. And you just tap on that and enter the question and I will be conveying questions to our panelists. As I've noted, this seminar is going to focus on the meaning of magical places and fictional worlds that help us get away from the tedious aspects of our daily lives and daily work. And this, kind of escapism, if that's the right term for it, let's say this kind of journey, has become all the more important for us as we read novels and watch films and binge TV watch and all of the other things we're doing to imagine experiences that take us away from the confining situations in which we're now living. We now have access to books and films through all kinds of devices and streaming services that have enabled us to travel in time and space as we sit month after month in our own homes. But what can we learn about our human aspirations, our human fears, our human identities by examining the appeal of imagined escapes? This is the kind of humanities-centered question that we like to explore at Carolina Public Humanities. And we're very glad that you've joined us this evening to uh, make the journey with us. We're gonna take a trip and we're gonna go to some unknown places. So in addition to thanking Paul Bonici for his technological work, I wanna express my appreciation to other members of the CPH team who have helped to organize this event, including Max Orr and Vicki Breeden and Susan Landstrom and Brian Ensminger, all of whom have been part of the team that has produced this event. And I also want to thank the Cotton Merca Group at Morgan Stanley for their ongoing support of our programs. And I especially appreciate also the generous support of Carolina Meadows, the continuing care retirement community in Chapel Hill that is one of our sponsors for all of our events. 
The support of these sponsors and many other contributing friends enables us to present these events. And I also want to thank our generous individual donors. Many of you are with us today and you have helped to sustain Carolina Public Humanities through your financial support during these very unsettled times. It's truly been a uh, financial roller coaster for all institutions over the last few months. And your support has meant a lot to the survival of Carolina Public Humanities. We also want to thank UNC's General Alumni Association for our ongoing partnership uh, with the, the Alumni Association. We have an ongoing partnership with the GAA that helps to support our programs, Humanities in Action at Flyleaf Books, which take place on Wednesdays. Many of these take place at Flyleaf Books, but now we are having them on Zoom as well. And um, these are continuing during the time of COVID. So we hope you'll also continue to buy books at the Flyleaf Bookstore. Um, I want to call attention to our next Humanities in Action program, which is coming next Wednesday, February 17th. And it will feature our colleague, Jonathan Oberlander, who's a professor and a chair of the Department of Social Medicine and, and the School of Medicine. And uh, Professor Oberlander will be speaking on the social and political issues that are affecting healthcare and the healthcare system in the United States today. This is gonna be a very interesting program next Wednesday for our Humanities in Action program at 3.30. I also wanna mention our ongoing program, which we call the Biography Series, which is led by Max Orr. This features uh, discussions with colleagues at UNC about famous and less famous people from the past or the present. And we call this series Lunch with Friends and Strangers. And it takes place at noon on Fridays. And our first uh, Lunch with Friends and Strangers of this semester will take place tomorrow. And it features a conversation about the uh, life and times of Jack Kerouac. And it features also our colleague Hassan Malehi, who is a professor of French and Francophone studies here at UNC. So I encourage you to, you can still sign up for this by going to the CPH um, event and you can join this with a pass that will carry you through the whole season of lunch with friends and strangers. So many of you have joined our programs over the years. You know that we've been organizing events since 1979 at Carolina Public Humanities. Uh, so we've just recently celebrated our 40th anniversary. We're now in our 42nd year. And of course, we've never had a year like this with all of our programs being online, but our goals and our mission have always remained the same, which is that we want to connect people within the university to people outside the university and with communities throughout the state of North Carolina and beyond, because we believe that the public humanities are essential for the public health of our state and society. We also have, in addition to the events I've mentioned, at Flyleaf Books and our, our various uh, other events, we organize special workshops for teachers through our Carolina K-12 program. Uh, and we also have programs with partners at community colleges, which we call uh, Humanities on the Road. And our goal in all of these events is to encourage humanities-centered conversations. I wanna stress that we're very interested in teachers. I believe we have one or two teachers with us today, but all of our events are open to teachers and we particularly celebrate the work that teachers do. We thank you for the way you're working in these very challenging times. And I remind you that if you are a teacher, you can receive uh, continuing education credits, certifications, uh, from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction by attending our program. And Paul Bonici can help you with that. And finally, I want to recognize and thank members of our advisory board who have continued to provide essential service and support throughout this pandemic. We couldn't really flourish without the support of this group. And I know a few of them are with us today. I think we might have Avi Allen and Phil Badur and Jerry Everhart. Uh, Sarah Gear may be with us, Claudia Cadis, Jeff Lang, Joe Rytok, Miriam Zietlow. 
I deeply appreciate your ongoing support and participation in our event. But I thank all of you for joining with us today for this event. So now I want to briefly summarize the plan for this webinar. I've noted that we're going to have three talks over two days and each session will last about 75 minutes and there will be time at the end of each session for questions and answers. And there will be a concluding panel discussion tomorrow evening um, in which we will have a discussion with all of the speakers. And that will be an additional opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, we'll be collecting questions through the Q&A function on your computer, as I mentioned. You simply click on that icon and you'll see a box in which you can write your question or comment, and I will convey the question to our speakers. And we're gonna use this same uh, process for this panel discussion, which begins tomorrow at 6.45 after Rachel Shavitz's uh, presentation on fantasy films. So each session of this seminar will focus on a different kind of imagined world of fantasy. But our overall goal is to examine how ideas about imaginary lands and magical realities have provided a framework for literary narratives, for science fiction, and for fantasy films. What makes this kind of work important? And what makes this kind of work popular as people face the real world challenges that shape our daily lives? And why is fantasy so popular in the present context as we face the challenges of the present situation? These are some of the questions that we want to discuss over the course of this seminar. Fantasy and reality may intersect in more ways than we can ever imagine as we go about our everyday lives. Sometimes people say fact is stranger than fiction, but fiction can also be very strange. So let's begin now with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Brian Sturm. Brian is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Information and Library Science here at UNC, and he's also a professor of information and library science. He completed his undergraduate studies at the College of William and Mary, studying French, I should note. And then he went on to get, receive both his master's and his PhD in library science at Indiana University. He joined the UNC faculty in 1998, and his work focuses on folklore, storytelling and literature, including especially stories aimed at children and young adults. He has been a professional storyteller for more than three decades. And before moving into academic positions, he worked in a natural history museum and also taught outdoor education to children in California. His academic work includes a notable co-authored book entitled The Storyteller's Sourcebook, 1983 to 99, which received the 2002 Storytelling World Award for Best Specialized Storytelling Resource. You can find other information about Brian's career and his many achievements on the biographical summary that you received before this seminar with a packet of information. So I'm very pleased that Brian is joining us this evening to share some of his knowledge and his perspectives. And he's going to present a talk entitled, The Magic Behind Escape, Immersion in Narrative Worlds. And it's my great pleasure now to welcome Brian Sturm to this event. Normally we would have a rousing round of applause, but Brian will imagine the applause. And I want to welcome Brian into the room. Nice to see you. Great, thank you for that introduction. And um, it's wonderful to be able to join you all here. Uh, it would be nice, nicer to be able to see you and be in person, but um, this is a wonderful use of technology um, to, to share ideas and to develop conversations that uh, without the tech, we wouldn't be able to do. So, um, it really is my pleasure to be here. I get to talk about story, which is something that I am absolutely thrilled to do. Any chance I get to talk story, I uh, will take. 
Um, and uh, I look forward to the question and answer afterwards and the other presenters and the panel uh, at the end to actually have more of a conversation. So this part will be a little bit more of an information push um, and uh, hopefully it will generate some ideas and some questions and some thoughts uh, for all of you listening. Um, the idea of escape is something that has probably undergirded most of my work um, as an academic. Um, because what fascinates me is what fascinates other people. And the whole concept of fascination and immersion in whatever it is that you're doing. And that could be um, something like reading a book and the escape and loss of yourself and loss of reality testing that happens when you read, or at least to some people. Um, it could be the immersion that we see, particularly in young people with uh, video games um, and with uh, people who are older sometimes in social media, uh, where they can spend five, six hours uh, on social media and not realize how much time has passed. Uh, but my particular interest uh, dates back to um, what Lloyd mentioned was that uh, when I graduated as an undergrad, I went out to work in Colorado uh, for my uncle, who was a wildlife biologist. And I minored in biology. I majored in French and minored in biology. And my, my desire was to be a scientist. Um, I actually wanted to be Jacques Cousteau is what I wanted to be, which is why I majored in French and minored in biology, because I grew up in Virginia Beach and Jacques Cousteau's center was in Norfolk, Virginia, about 10 miles from where I, where I grew up. Um, but it turned out that uh, an undergraduate degree in French and a minor in biology was nowhere near enough to qualify me to go out on his boat. And so um, I went into other kinds of things. And I got into, I worked for my uncle for a year, or for a, a summer. And after that, I realized that I actually wasn't a research scientist. Um, and I got an opportunity to go out to California, just south of San Francisco, and work as an outdoor educator with children um, in what was at that point the um, San Francisco YMCA camp. And it was rented during the school year by the uh, San Joaquin County School District. And so I went out there and I spent two years in this the majestic redwood forest. It was absolutely an incredible place to work. And what I found was that every day I would line my little group of kids up. They were fifth and sixth graders. And we would go out on hikes. And I would teach them ecology. I would teach them you know, the, the various cycles. Um, I would teach them about weather. We did survival tactics. Uh, we had a lot of fun with them. And they'd stay with us for a week. And what I found was that as I took them on these trails and told them these facts, um, they very quickly forgot them or never internalized them at all. And I found that very frustrating as a teacher. I wanted them to, to remember what I taught them. And I thought, well, how can I do this? And then I thought, well, what about stories? Let's see, when I take them on a night hike, instead of just pointing out the stars and the constellations, what if I tell them a story about the constellations? Will they remember that? So I started looking into the Greek myths for the star and the constellation stories. Um, I looked into Native American um, stories that were local to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I started telling stories about particular animals and trees um, and why they are the way they are. And what I found was that I would go down to the San Joaquin Valley six months after the children had been up with me. And um, they would say, oh, hey, Brian, how are you doing? I remember that story you told me. And they could, they could tell me the story that I had told them. They'd forgotten all the facts, but they remember the stories. Um, and so I, saw, I thought, there's something powerful here. I'm not quite sure what it is, but um, it's intriguing. And then I, I did my two years there and uh, was just immersed in the folk literature. And then I went down to uh, New Zealand and Australia and spent about three and a half months um, backpacking and exploring there. And I had read a lot of the Maori folk tales. 
uh, before going down. And so I decided that what I would do is spend my time in New Zealand walking in amongst all of these fabulous folk tales. And it was true. I mean, I, I would go I'd walk along a sandy beach and there was a story about that beach. Um, I went to the north of the North Island and there was a, a, a beautiful Pahutakawa tree growing on a crag out in the, uh, out in the, by the ocean. And I had read a, a story, a folk tale about how the, the spirits of the Maori when they die, go up this beach all the way to that Pahutakawa tree and they slide down the roots into the water and they swim off to Hawaiiki, which is the, uh, the Maori um, sort of afterlife and, and heaven. Um, and so I, I was there and, and the world came alive in a way for me with those stories that it never had before. And it taught me to see with a very different set of eyes. So then I came back to, uh, to North America and I thought, well, I'll get a, an outdoor education job on the East Coast, but they didn't exist. And so I ended up um, getting a job as a children's librarian. And as a children's librarian, I had the opportunity to uh, do story time. And I was reading aloud, but I also wanted to use the stories that I had learned. And so I started telling the stories and I noticed an incredible difference between when I would read a book, hold a book up and, and read it aloud to the kids. And when I would tell a story from, from my mind uh, without a book. And the difference was that when I told a story or read a story aloud, the children's attention was divided between looking at the book, uh, sometimes trying to read it if they were old enough, and, um, and listening to me. But when I told a story, all of their attention was focused right here on my face. And um, it was immensely powerful for me as a performer, but I found that they also would go from really attentive and their eyes would like all lit up and their bodies would be, would be excited. And then you'd get into the story and you'd see this change come over their faces where their faces would kind of go slack. And they get this dreamy look in their eyes and they'd sit like that for the whole story. And at the end, you get this little blink and they'd come back. And I thought to myself, what is going on with these kids? And that kept me fascinated with stories and narrative. And then um, I got so interested in being a children's librarian that I went back to uh, Indiana University to get my master's because I, I was on the track to be a children's librarian. And it turned out that I took a storytelling class uh, as part of my master's degree. And again, I had this experience where both as a listener and as a teller, there was this almost trance-like hypnotic kind of quality um, space that you would go into as a teller and as a listener. And I thought, what's going on here? This is really powerful. I've known this is powerful for years now. What's happening? And that launched me on the, the path of an academic. Um, I got my doctorate there. Um, I wrote my dissertation on the entrancing power of storytelling. And since then, I've been adding to the models that I created and trying to develop my understanding of, um, of what I call the story listening trance. Um, and so that's kind of what I'd like to share with you is that experience and the models uh, behind that um, story listening trance. And I think it's, it holds true, perhaps slightly different um, uh, induction patterns of how to induce the trance with reading and video games and music and a variety of the different arts and humanities. Um, but I think fundamentally the experience is actually quite similar across all of those modalities. So when you think about sort of information and information seeking and information uh, formats and contexts, I think this kind of information applies to, to all of them. Um, so that's what I would like to do. I'd like to share those models with you, walk you through them, hopefully develop some, um, some good questions from those models from you. Um, and for, I hope that you can help me develop them and add pieces to them that I haven't had an opportunity to, to uh, think about. Um, so it will become a, a true sort of exploration uh, for all of us. Um, let me get, uh, actually, no, before I, before I start my PowerPoint, 
um, since I'm a storyteller and since I, I'm interested in this whole trance process, I thought, let me tell you a story. I don't know whether you'll experience it or not. I hope you do. Uh, but the story itself is one of the few in the world folk literature that I have been able to find that actually addresses this very issue of escaping into a narrative. Um, there are very few folk tales that actually address this. There are some literary stories that do, um, but the folk literature does not have a lot on this. And so I want to tell you the, the story that I have that really does. And if any of you know of other stories that do this, I would welcome um, additions to this repertoire. So this is a story that comes from the um, Folk Tales of India, collection by A.K. Ramanujan. Um, and it's called, What Happens When You Really Listen? And this is the way it goes. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there lived an old woman and a little old man. And they were happily married, except for one thing. The little old woman felt the little old man was uncultured. He had no, no class about him, and she was constantly trying to find ways to educate him and bring him into a state of betterness. Well, it didn't work very well, and he continued to work the land and, and come home in the evenings tired and, and quiet. And then one day, the little old woman heard that the reciter, the great reciter of the Ramayana, the great um, Hindu epic, was coming to the village. And she thought, ah, this is it. This is how I will get my husband some culture. I will send him to listen to this great reciter. And so that evening, when her husband came back from the fields, she said, husband, husband, there is a wonderful opportunity for you. I want you to go down to the village and I want you to listen to the reciter as he speaks and chants and tells the stories of the Ramayana. And her husband looked at her and said, oh wife, oh, I am so tired. I have no desire to go listen to a reciter, but you must said his wife. You must because, well, because you must, she said. It will be a great opportunity for you. And she cajoled and she wheedled and she nagged and she whined until finally he agreed to go. So off he went down to the village square and all of the people had gathered as the evening came on to listen to this great reciter tell the stories from the Ramayana. Well, he sat down and he began to listen and it had been a long day. And his eyes began to droop and his head began to nod. And pretty soon he fell fast asleep and he slept all night long. Well, the next morning, as was the custom of the time, the children took sweets around to the listeners and uh, they offered them sweets as a, as a parting for, for, the eve, for the morning the experience. And um, the old man was sitting there with his mouth hanging wide open from sleep. And a little child ran by and she took a sweet and she popped it in his mouth and ran on. And you know, the taste began to work its way into the old man's brain and he woke up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He thought, that's yeah, quite nice. And he went on home. Well, he got home and his wife was waiting for him. And she said, husband, husband, how was the performance? How was the, how was the Ramayana? And he said, wife, it was, it was quite sweet. Ha <laughs> ha, she thought, yes, yes, indeed it is. My husband is getting culture at last. And she said to him, husband, you must go back again tonight and listen some more. Oh, but I, I have to go work in the fields, he said. Yes, but tonight you will listen again. Oh, all right, he said. And so the next night, back he went, back down to the village square. 
And he sat down and he began to listen, but again, he was tired from working in the fields and his eyes drooped and his head drooped and he fell fast asleep once again. Well, as he slept there, there was a young boy who came up to the back side of the audience and he was looking and trying to, to find a way to see and he couldn't see. He could hear, but he couldn't see and he wanted to see the reciter. And so he saw this, saw this old man asleep there. And so very carefully, he climbed up onto his shoulders and put his legs up over his shoulders and sat there. And all night long, he listened and raptured as the reciter chanted and sang and told the stories of the Relina. And in the morning, he clambered down and he went on home. Well, eventually the old man woke up as the sun warmed his body and he tried to stand up and oh, his back hurt and his shoulders ached. And he stood his old body up and he tottered his way back home. He got home and his wife, of course, was waiting for him. Husband, she said, husband, how was the storytelling? How was the Ramayana? How were the stories? And he said, oh, wife, they got heavier and heavier as the night went on. Oh, yes, yes, said his wife, yes. Oh, that's exactly how it is. Those are the stories I remember. Oh, she thought to herself, he's getting cultured. This is marvelous. And she said to him, you must go back again tonight. Uh, if I must, said the old man. And so he went and worked in the fields all day. And that night he came back and had some food and then went on down to listen. But he was exhausted. He hadn't slept too well the two nights before. He'd worked all day. And he fell fast asleep and he was so tired that he couldn't even hold himself up and he just fell over and fell asleep on the ground. All night long he slept there on the cold ground and when morning approached there was a dog walking around and the dog saw that old man and mistook him for a log and he went right by and raised his leg and peed right into the old man's mouth and <laughs> <laughs> he woke up. Ah, that was awful in time. And he went on home. Well, he got home and his wife was waiting for him. Husband, how were the stories? How was the storytelling? How was the Ramayana? And he said, it was awful. What? Said his wife. It was salty. What? Said his wife. Oh, husband, what have you been doing? And she badgered him and she nagged him and she cajoled him and wheedled and whined until finally he said and admitted that he'd been falling asleep. And this crushed all of her plans for him. And so she said, tonight, husband, I will come with you so that you stay awake. And so she did. The two of them went down that night and she sat him in the very front row. And she said, husband, stay awake and listen. And so he did. And he sat there and he listened as the reciter began to tell a story from the Ramayana of Hanuman, the monkey god. You see, Rama had just had his wife, Sita, abducted by the demon king. And, the, and Rama turned to Hanuman, his, his, his friend and his servant, and he said, you must take this signet ring to my wife, to Sita. Now the demon king has taken her out to an island in the middle of the ocean, but I know how strong you are and you must take this ring and you must take it to the ocean and you must jump across the ocean and give it to her so that she does not lose hope. I will do it, said Hanuman. And the old man listened in rapture. Hanuman took the ring and he began to run as fast as he could run and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran until he came to the ocean and as he reached the edge of the ocean he took a mighty leap up into the sky and he sailed across the ocean but halfway across the signet ring in his finger slipped and fell down 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 disappeared into the ocean 
And Hanuman continued on through the air and landed in the demon king's island with no ring to give to Sita. And he stood there wringing his hands, wondering, what can I do? Oh, how can I get the ring? And all of a sudden, the old man listening stood up and he said, don't worry, Hanuman, I'll get the ring for you. And he dived into the ocean and he swam down to the bottom and he looked and looked until finally he found the ring and he picked it up, swam back up to the surface and he handed the signet ring to Hanuman. And forever after in that village, the people of the village looked on that old man as one of the wisest of all the elders. And thankfully, he behaved that way. Which just goes to show you what happens when you really listen. So that's the story of what happens when you really listen from the collection by um, A.K. Ramanujan. Um, if you want the citation, we can certainly give it to you. Um, I can make that available. Um, but I can, uh, when I start up my video here, let me start my, um, share my screen and I'm going to show you my PowerPoint. Should load up here in just a moment. There we are. Okay. Um, so I am at the School of Information and Library Science. Um, most of what I teach, I teach a storytelling class, I teach a children's literature class, I teach a youth services and public libraries class. So most of my work is focused on children um, and narrative. But the, the story I just told comes from this collection, Folk Tales from India. It's on page 55 if you want to actually track it down in real life. Um, but it's a, this is a wonderful collection of, of Indian folk tales. Um, so as you think about what I just told and, and the story that I told, what happens is uh, a person goes to um, this storytelling event and gets so enraptured by the performance and the story and the content that they, uh, that, the, that the old man loses himself. He loses his ability to test reality to know that he's, he's sitting here. And we have this happen all the time. It happens in movies as well. And you forget that you're in a movie theater and you forget that there are people sitting beside you. And movie theaters are actually interesting because they use a number of techniques like the enormous screen and the really loud uh, sound uh, and the dimming of lights. All of those things are to help you focus on this other world that they're trying to get you involved in. And storytelling does similar kinds of things. So I want to show you the first model, which is here, on, um, on what I think happens during this story listening experience. Okay, and, and again, when I say story listening, it's because my primary interest is in folk tales and storytelling, but I think this similar kind of thing would work if you replace the teller with the author, you could probably make this work somewhat with, uh, with literature as well. So it starts here at the top of the, uh, of the model, works its way around clockwise, sequentially one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and the, the whole thing starts in this realm, what I call the, the realm of conversation or your quotidian realm, your realm of reality testing, where you're actively conscious, okay? Hopefully that's where you are right now, although I hope that you were not there when I was telling the story. Um, I hope I was able to transport you at least a little bit. Um, but in that realm of conversation, when we all have our turns at speaking and um, we're, we're not sort of entranced by anything. Um, then all of a sudden, perhaps in that conversation, somebody says, hey, let me tell you a story. And as soon as that happens, and as soon as the people agree, because usually a storytelling transaction is one in which the people allow someone else to have an extended turn at speaking. Um, that then designates somebody as the teller and the others as listeners. Now, 
in my model, it's, it's very much a teller listener model, which is a very Western kind of approach to storytelling and not just Western, but pretty much Western European um, approach because there are other cultures in which storytelling is very interactive and trying to figure out who's the storyteller and who's the listener actually can become quite confusing because everybody plays an active participatory role in, in creating the performance. Um, but for my model and for my, uh, my, my process here, I want to tease out the, the teller and the listeners. So in stage one, you get that sense of teller and listener. In stage two, uh, which I'm calling the story realm, and I use that uh, language because there was a wonderful dissertation um, written by Catherine Galloway Young um, called Tale Worlds and Story Realms, A Phenomenology of Narrative. And she talks in there about how the world that is created in storytelling can bleed over um, into actual real life experiences. And so people will refer to things in casual conversation that they've heard in stories and story characters can play more active metaphorical roles or even real roles in people's daily lives. And that was her dissertation, but she uses this, this word story realm in, in sort of a transitional way. Um, she calls the world of immersed story, um, the tale world, and she calls this transitional space the story realm. And I, I like that, um, and so I borrowed that from her. Um, and so in stage two here, you see that the teller introduces the concept of a story, but we still don't know anything about the story. That's why the line is dotted. It, it doesn't have a lot of cohesive power. Um, but the teller begins to form a relationship with the listeners. And if you have ever sort of analyzed good public speaking, you see this happen all the time. Um, public speakers will stand up in front of an audience if, they're, if they know what they're doing. And the first thing they will usually do is tell a short two to three minute personal anecdote. If you go to conferences, you'll, you'll hear this all the time. And it's usually the getting to the conference story, right? The harrowing adventure I went through to get to the conference. Uh, but the point of that is not to portray any of the content that the person is trying to convey. It's to develop this emotional rapport and a connection with the audience to say, we're all in this together. Let me take you on a journey. You can trust me. I will take you there and I will bring you back. So that rapport and, and the overlap of those circles between the teller and the two listeners um, shows that beginning connection. Okay. In stage three, the teller begins to get involved in the story. Um, and this is actually a very interesting dynamic because um, beginning storytellers often find that they, get, they actually get immersed in their story and they forget their audience, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, it's sort of that with the, in theater, they call it the fourth wall, right? Where you, where you sort of tune the audience out. But in story, in live performance storytelling, we tend to like to see our audiences and we like to get feedback and reaction from them. And so the, the process for the storyteller is one of partial immersion in the story while maintaining this connection with the listeners um, so that you can monitor your performance, monitor their feedback and alter the story improvisationally if you see that you're losing your audience, right? So if you tune them out, you won't know, you won't get the feedback. So you have to remain um, somewhat aware of what they're doing. And with my storytelling students in my class, I like to call that, what I, it's what I call the veil of story. Um, and so if you think about a veil or, or the curtains on a, on a set, on a theater set, and if those curtains come down and block you, Yes, you're immersed in your story, but you're not connecting with your audience. And the idea is that as you get better as a storyteller, you pull that veil apart so that you're looking through it. You're still immersed in your story, but you're still, you're also connecting through that veil to your audience, okay? And typically in stage three of this model anyway, the, the teller's relationship to that story at this stage is still fairly tenuous. You're not immersed, you're just warming up. 
But as you reach stage four, the story actually begins to take on more prominence, it becomes more powerful, and the teller becomes more immersed. Um, the listeners begin to make a connection with the story and feel its power, and they begin to forget about their world and their reality, and they go into this narrative world that you're creating. And if you are lucky and skilled, um, and the conditions are right, and the context is right, and everything falls into place, you can reach this stage five, which is the altered state of consciousness. Um, it's, it's an alternate or altered reality. It's, it, it's a very different, phenomenologically, qualitatively different space that you enter. And this is where, when those young children's faces went slack, and their breathing and heart rate slowed, um, and they looked almost stunned, um, this is the state that they were in at that point. And it's the children tend to go into this very, very easily. Adults are, are a little harder to get there. Um, and some adults have sort of trained themselves not to go there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the, um, if, if, if it works, then the story becomes immensely, immensely powerful. Um, and it can, it can absorb everybody into it. As I say, the, the storyteller needs to try and maintain at least a little piece of themselves outside the story world so you can monitor your audience. But I've, I've changed the designation of the teller and the listener there because the dynamic of this is, um, I think, not unique to storytelling, but it's perhaps unusual uh, because there, everybody in the storytelling oral performance is in a sense co-creating the story. Um, and the reason I say that is that as I tell a story, I don't give you pictures, I give you words, I give you sound, I may give you some gestures, but the rest of that is up to your imagination to fill in the details. And the, and the clever storyteller, whether that's an author or a performer um, or even a, a video game designer, the, or a movie creator, all of those are adept at including just enough detail to capture your attention, but not so much that you don't use your imagination, right? Um, and this is actually true, very true of um, graphic novels. So if you read comics or graphic novels, you have a picture and then another picture beside it and Things happen in between, in the gutter, between those two frames. And what happens in between is the creative moment for the reader, right? It's where you as a reader have to move from one image that you've been given to another image in, uh, that you've been given and find either a causal relationship or a chronological relationship, some kind of relationship between those two moments. So as a, as a performer, we want to leave some space, and actually quite a lot of space, for our audience to create and co-create with us. And that's why this feedback loop is so important. Because if you see a quizzical expression on your, on your listeners' faces, you realize very quickly that you said something they don't understand and that you need to alter your performance or explain something more or give some more detail to help them clarify their notion of what they're hearing. Okay, and so there's this constant improvisation that happens, the feedback loop between the teller and the listeners, between these co-creators that happens in this moment. And it's absolutely an amazing feeling to look out over an audience and see people entering this state of transport, um, it's been called narrative transport, to, um, to this other world, okay? So that's stage five. And again, you don't always get there, but it's kind of the goal for storytellers to get to this point. At some point, as your story begins to wind down, you go to stage six and the storyteller begins to remove themselves from the story, pull back a little bit, ease off from the intensity, let the, the parameters and the borders of the world disintegrate a little bit, let reality creep back in a little bit and, um, and, and move away from the listeners. You can see the listeners' bubbles are also overlapping because there is a what could be called sort of a bandwagon effect 
where you get an audience and, and you're sitting there in the audience and you're, you're listening, but you're not engaged and you look over beside the person beside you is entranced and you think to yourself, well, what do they find so interesting? And you tune in in a slightly different way and it captures you. So there is, there's a, an influence between the listeners as well in this kind of uh, uh, performance event. Um, but the story begins to lose its power. And um, then eventually in, in stage seven, the, the story becomes this external thing. This has been, you've moved on, you've concluded, you've reached the denouement and worked your way out the end of it. You're still connected with your listeners uh, because you don't want to release that until the very, very end. And, uh, but they aren't connected as much with each other because um, they're coming out of the, the journey as well. Um, and returning to reality. And then eventually you cycle back to stage one where everybody's in their normal state and normal work breaking uh, conversational kind of mode. So that is what I was, this is the model that I've developed from beginning in the dissertation and then with other research that I've done that um, seems to capture this whole story listening experience from the moment you sit down to um, the moment the story is, is over. But the really interesting thing for me has been this middle circle, the middle black dotted circle. Uh, because one would kind of expect that this is, if it's circular, that you have to go through stage one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and go back to one. But it's not actually true. The, the, the stages are, are uh, the borders to these stages are not fixed. Um, so they're permeable. And so you can be in a deep story listening trance state where you're totally engaged. And um, imagine you're at the opera, right? And you're totally engaged in that performance. And then all of a sudden, your neighbor in the seat beside you starts to unwrap one of those candy wrappers and crinkle, 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 crinkle. And suddenly you're, you're back in reality, right? And more than likely, you're, you're kind of disgruntled with the person um, because you are enjoying the experience of being engaged. Um, but you don't then have to necessarily go back through every one of these stages, two, three, four, to get back to five. You can pop out and you can pop back in. Um, it's what in my dissertation I called the flicker effect uh, because you can, you, you literally can, can jump in, jump out, jump in, jump out. It's very, very quick. And as a storyteller, I can't expect to keep people engaged for my entire story. Um, I, can, I can hope that they will be engaged for parts of it. I will lose them. I'll reel them back in, try to anyway. They'll go back out. And so there's this constant ebb and flow in the story listening experience where you're at various levels of engagement with the tale. Um, but it's, it's kind of refreshing to realize that if you do lose somebody, you're not necessarily going to have to work all the way around this circle to, uh, to get them back. OK? All right, so I think I spent enough time with this model. What I want to do now is I would like to, um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Let me jump over to um, the next model, which is stage five only, okay? So if you, if you drill down into stage five and what's going on there, then you come up with something along these lines. All right, I'm gonna walk you through parts of this. Um, we can make, I think we can make this available to, to all of you if you would like to have it to think about and to process. Um, but basically the, the circle on the other one is captured in a line here, okay? You start over here in your baseline state of consciousness. You go through the transitional state, which was uh, states two, three, and four in the other model, the story realm. You enter the altered state of consciousness, if you do, um, and then you jump back and forth through these transitional states and baseline states of consciousness until eventually you come out of the story at the end. Okay, that's the middle part. But the interesting part is this top and the bottom pieces, um, because there, that is where um, we can we can see the various components of the story experience, storytelling experience, the story, the teller, the actual transaction or the performance, the listener end of it and the context in which it all takes place. And then you can see a variety of things that I've been able to 
tease out in my you know, readings of other people um, and in my research that impact this altered state of consciousness. And the ones that I've listed for you here tend to be the things that augment that altered state. Okay, the things that detract from it and pop you out could be broadly classified as distractions. Um, and uh, I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time actually seeing whether there are different kinds of distractions that, um, that impact our consciousness. But I, I was able to, to find in my dissertation research, and it was very, you know, just um, a sort of a tangent, that there was something that I wanted to call a distractibility threshold. Uh, because the deeper you go into this experience, um, it seems that it, the harder it is to distract you and get you out of it. Um, there are certainly certain kinds of distractions that are gonna have a, a, an ease of getting through to your consciousness. And those would be things that were you know, physically dangerous to you um, and, or extremely loud or, or whatever. But there are, there's a threshold at which even if something happens in the external world, your consciousness is not gonna notice it. You're gonna tune it out and stay in this altered world. Okay, that's all I really want to say about distractions. I'm happy to come back to it in the Q&A. Um, but you'll see here that there are a lot of different elements and techniques that we can use as tellers um, to either as a listener to allow ourselves to get involved or as a teller to help our listeners get involved in a performance. Um, I, I probably don't have time to go through all of them. And if we want to come back to some in the q and I'm happy to do that as well. But there are a few that I'd really like to spend a little bit of time on here um, so that you understand uh, some, some things that are sort of unique to storytelling, I think. Um, and the first one of those is paradox, up in the story one, in the second line. Folk tales uh, have survived for generation, some people would say millennia. Um, but if you think about an oral society, if a story isn't any good, it's not going to get told, and it's not going to be repeated. And so it'll die. And so the stories that have been handed down and handed down from generation to generation have been winnowed and threshed and, and, and cared for and curated in a way that has made them immensely powerful to our human psyche. Um, and interestingly, a lot of them have very odd beginnings that don't make any sense cognitively at all. Um, and perhaps our, our most popular one in the Western tradition is once upon a time. Think about that. Once upon a time. What does that mean? Doesn't really mean anything. So why do we start it that way? There are other folk tales that begin, there was, there was, and there was not. What does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. There was, there was, and there was not. In a time before time. What does that mean? All of these nonsensical or paradoxical story beginnings. Why are there so many of them? Why do they appear so often in folklore? And I have a theory. I don't have any facts to back it up. Not yet. I, have, I, I want to wire people up and see what their brains are doing uh, when they listen to stories, but I haven't been able to work that out yet. It's uh, for down the line, I think, once I, if I ever step down from my associate deaning and my administrative role and have more time for research. But the idea, the theory that I have is that when you get a, ling a linguistic paradox, where it doesn't make any sense linguistically, then if you think about the brain and how we process information, a lot of the linguistic processing is in the left hemisphere of our brain. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, our left hemisphere is much more clinical and, and logical and um, sort of rigorous and demanding and critical. And our right hemisphere is much more gestalt and um, holistic and visual spatial. Um, 
and you know that's a very simplified way to look at the brain i know um, but th there seems to be from what i've been able to, to read and understand of, of the scientific literature there seems to be this general kind of division between the function of the left hemisphere and the function of the right so if you think about it what happens if you feed a linguistic paradox to the language center of your brain, to the left hemisphere, the critical side of your brain. It can't handle it. And so it freezes. It says, I can't handle this, and shunts it over to the right-hand side of the brain to say, see if you can handle it. The right-hand side of the brain, which is holistic and gestalt and doesn't, doesn't mind contradiction, says, oh yeah, that's fine. I don't mind talking animals. I can make sense of that. Um, I don't mind a, a once upon a time that doesn't make any sense. I can accept that. And perhaps the right hemisphere of the brain begins to fire up. Well, if the right hemisphere of the brain is the visual spatial hemisphere as well, what have we just done? With one simple story beginning, we have taken our listeners and asked or encouraged their brains to go from critical analytical to accepting gestalt, holistic, magical, visual, spatial. And that's exactly where we want them in story listening. We want them visualizing. We want them accepting what we say, even though it's crazy. Um, and so I've got this theory that these paradoxical story beginnings that appear in, in many languages and, and many different kinds of forms, um, have been devised to help us trick the brain of our listeners into visualizing, agreeing, accepting, and entering the narrative worlds that we're creating. So that's the, that's the paradox piece of it um, and my, my theory behind it. And if anyone uh, wants to explore further, I would love to figure out how to test that and see whether it's actually true. Um, what else here? Uh, you can see that novelty and familiarity, while they seem contrapuntal, um, are not actually, they both work. Um, novelty can get us involved more, perhaps more intellectually because we want to know what happens. Familiarity can get us involved because it relaxes us. We can sort of sigh and relax. And if I were to say, let me tell you the story of the three billy goats gruff. Some of you who grew up with that story may go, oh yeah. I'd love to hear that one again. I haven't heard that since I was a kid, right? So, I mean, I think there are ways in which familiarity works as well. Uh, we certainly want our stories to be visually evocative and emotionally charged because um, both of those venues are, are very engaging. Um, there is research that shows that, that hyperstimulation of our eyes can put us into trance, um, audit, what they call auditory and, and visual driving. Um, the, uh, the emotional power and the emotional charge of it is also very engaging because honestly, one of the reasons we read, one of the reasons we listen to stories is to identify with characters and to feel the emotions that they're, that they're feeling. The plot is important, but it's not as important as the, as the emotions that the characters go through. And so as storytellers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to evoke those characters' emotions so fully that our listeners feel them and empathize with them and, uh, and experience the reality that the character is going through. The storyteller also has a lot of uh, techniques um, at their command. Your voice, your appearance, um, your actual involvement as a storyteller. Um, your enthusiasm for the story is contagious. Um, I have seen storytellers before who obviously weren't interested in the stories they were telling and uh, they fell flat, right? The, the audiences weren't engaged. Um, and then just the, the overall ability uh, of the storyteller is important. Um, that actually goes back to classical rhetoric as well, where um, they talk about the ethos of the performer, of the reciter. Um, or of the debater and the persuasive power of someone who feels and sheds this sort of confident glow. Um, so the, the performer who comes on the stage with that sense of commanding the audience and engagement and enthusiasm, uh, that's all palpable and it's all contagious. The performance transaction itself 
is, uh, is also very important. Um, eye contact is huge um, in storytelling. We want to make eye contact. We want to make meaningful eye contact. And this has been immensely hard for my beginning storytellers who tend to look away at the emotionally powerful moments because it's scary. You have to be vulnerable to do this. Um, so that's a very important thing. And then let me jump down here toward the bottom um, because there's this, um, this sense of in the listener, the identification, that's the, the I went to the fourth one down, um, and then the, the right-hand column identification with characters, with emotions, settings, or actions. You can identify with any number of things. But I want to talk a little bit about what's called the deictic shift. Deictus is um, a, a linguistic term for words that don't mean anything unless they have a context. So if I say, go there, it doesn't mean anything, right? It, if I say go there and point, then I give you the context that you need and, and there makes sense. Um, pronouns can be the same kind of way. Um, and so if I say you do something, it could mean anybody. Um, and the, but the interesting one is I. And this is, I think, why dialogue in stories, both in, in written texts and in performance, why dialogue is so important. Um, because in dialogue, the character uses the pronoun I. And I can mean any different number of, of references. It can mean I, the character. It, with a storyteller, it can mean I, the storyteller. And as the listener, it means I as well, right? Um, so it can, it can refer to the listener. And I think as the, as the characters speak and use the I, then the listener hears let's say a, a character say, I went to the store. The listener hears and translates, you went to the store, but hears, I went to the store. And so increases that identification and that immersion in the story. Um, so, I mean, th this is all, I mean, I can, I can talk for hours on this stuff because I find it absolutely fascinating, but I think I probably need to stop. Um, I'm, I'm running a little short on time. I wanna leave time for question and answer as well. Um, so let me just kick over to my quick thank you slide and I'll stop sharing. And um, so I'll, let's, let's open it up to some questions. Um, I've got, let me put my chat back on and see. Okay. So um, Lloyd is coming back on. Let there me come go. back in. So uh, thank you, Brian. Can we now hear each other okay? I hope. Yes. Yes. Okay. I I, I've got a, a couple of questions that I want to start with. I, I want to begin with a story that uh, Jonathan Gerard told, um, who understands the tradition of rabbis and storytelling. And I, I simply want to to mention that he tells a long story in the, in the Q&A about, about rabbis who went into the forest to try to overcome misfortunes and one built a fire and another one says a prayer and they, they all do different things and God rewards them and helps them solve a problem. But finally, there's a rabbi who, uh, Rabbi Israel of Ritzin, to overcome his misfortune, he can only sit in an armchair, his head in his hands, and he says to God, I'm unable to light the fire. I don't know the prayer. I don't even know where the place in the forest. All I can do is tell the story, and this must be sufficient to overcome his misfortune. And it was sufficient, and God made man because he loves stories. Yeah, okay? like so this is a wonderful story about how stories are part of... <laughs> Yeah, even God loves a really good story. Okay? That's right. Uh, but this actually leads in, that's not so much a question, I think, as a, as a good example of what you're talking about. But one of our participants, Abby Allen, says um, that you began with a story from the Ramayana, is a, from a Hindu mythology, mm -hmm. and that myths are rooted in ancient religions and so that does, does the story require that people know something about the religious tradition from which the story might come? Or I, I would even expand this question a little bit and ask, why do you think so many religious traditions are built around stories, like the stories of the Bible or the story of Jesus or the story, you know, there's just endless stories, David yeah. and King Solomon. 
Yeah. So more generally, the relation between religion and storytelling. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fascinating. It's a, a great question and um, you know, a, a perceptive comment too. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think that um, there, there's beginning research to suggest at least that humans think in story. Um, and if you think about it, 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 it sort of resonates um, because you, know, you have an experience and what do you do? You go tell your friends about it and that's a story. Um, we don't think in facts, we don't think in discrete units of information. We think in these sort of synthesized um, kinds of, of, of narratives. Um, and if that's the case, it, I think it makes complete sense that um, all the major religions have lots of stories in them because as we listen to stories, we, if, especially I think if we get immersed in this way, if we think about it as an altered state of consciousness, a legitimate qualitatively different experience, um, similar perhaps to a light hypnotic trance, um, if that's the case, then there's the possibility that just as with hypnosis, there is the power of suggestion um, and, and sort of bypassing the conscious critical mind to get directly to the, to the unconscious or the subconscious. Um, if that's the case, then if we can do the same kind of trance-like experience with storytelling, the same opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if, if the religions are trying to get across a, a particular message, I can't think of a better way for them to do it than to offer up a story that allows people not necessarily even to have to deal with the issue themselves because it's not them, right? It's the character who's going through the story. And um, I can identify with that character, but I can experience it vicariously. I can separate it myself from it if I have to. Um, and so, um, you know, some of, the, some of the really powerful stories uh, that are deeply moving and um, you know you can leave an audience crying at the end of the story, but there's a cathartic quality to the to the emotional release. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of these stories, um, particularly when they were you know originally told in oral cultures, um, the the wise people, the wise women, the shaman, you know, the, oftentimes what would happen is the there would be a disagreement, a civil disagreement or a legal disagreement. And um, the, the wounded parties would go to the wise elder and say, here's the problem. And the response for the elder was not, well, you need to do this. It was, let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, and through the venue of the story, you avoided the, the sort of um, immediacy of this is my problem and, and, and my, my enemy's problem. You could, you could distance yourself and vicariously you could work through the problem, see how someone else worked through the problem, develop some coping skills and walk away with an aha moment that said, oh yeah, I can see how I can solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine and, and someone else has, has raised this point in the, the Q&A, there could be a mystical dimension to a story because you described a kind of trance-like experience that the listener is carried into so that the greatest religious stories, which can be told over and over again, um, can each time carry the listener into a, a mystical space. Yes. So that it's not surprising that religious stories become linked to mystical experiences right. from your model. <clears throat> right. They're, they're in stage five, we might say, of your yeah. chart. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and, <laughs> and I think that there's a, a Christmas Eve service and someone's hearing the Christmas story for the 20th time and said, I think you're in stage five right now, you know? That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, and it, and it definitely does happen. In fact, there are whole books written on religious ecstasy. Yeah. Um, and, and that experience of a religious transcendence, um, I think is probably, I, I would think, Compared to what I talk about with folklore and the story listening trance, the, the religious ecstatic trance is way more powerful and deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the same way that the altered states of consciousness that are drug induced or, you know, the whirling dervishes or, you know, whatever these, these sort of induction methods that we have to induce altered states of consciousness, some of those altered states um, are, are much more stable 
and, and lasting and dangerous, some of them, um, than the story listening trance, which is, I think is a very, it tends to be a fairly light trance. Although I have had students in my class um, as they were listening to stories, have a story that um, I remember I had one student who uh, had recently broken up with her boyfriend and um, the story that was told was, uh, was a very sad, unrequited love story. And she just burst into tears at the end of it. So actually, this is really interesting because uh, Katie in, in the Q&A has noted that stories symbolize important points in an individual's life uh, with the point of uh, the purpose of centering and harmonizing the individual. So when we respond to a, a story, it connects with something in our own life. I mean, this, this gets into a psychological or even psychoanalytic area, yeah. which we might say links it to dream world as well, right? Because when you have a dream, a dream is a story, often a story that makes no sense in normal life, right. but has meaning to you, right? Right. And, and you know, I think with, with dreams, it's a little harder to, to often to figure out what they mean. Um, but the, the psychoanalytical literature on, on dreams is absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, the Jungian approach, which is to, to sort of think about your dream as, a, as an element of yourself. So your, the dream characters are different parts of your personality. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, you know, I, I uh, have a dream about falling off a cliff. It's not about legitimately falling off a cliff. It's about the feeling of part of you that feels as though it's falling off a cliff. Right? Yeah. Um, and so the, the analysis of those dreams can be incredibly illuminating about the things that are important in your lives um, and uh, the meaning that you ascribe to them. And that's very individual. And the mm -hmm. same is true of any story that I tell. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I, I and I, this goes back to, I think the first question of, does a listener need to know all of the background of the Indian culture in order to understand the full meaning of that story. And my response would be, it would certainly help, right? Um, I mean, it, the more you know about a culture, the deeper and richer the stories become because the symbolism and the metaphors become multi-layered as opposed to superficial. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's essential to get something out of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions that is, is always discussed in the storytelling world and the literature and by practicing storytellers is um, whose stories am I allowed to tell? Um, can I only tell my own culture stories? Can I tell stories from other cultures? Is that cultural appropriation? Um, you know, can I, can I actually tell someone else's culture's stories um, and, and be a cultural ambassador mm -hmm. um, and, and do it authentically? And um, there are vehement conversations on both sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. And my take as a, as a performer who is predominantly not, I'm not trying to disseminate culture, I'm trying to disseminate good stories that will get people to think about life and to experience life in new ways and to experience emotions in new ways. And so I have told, I have given myself the license to um, tell stories from other cultures. So long as I don't try and be an authentic cultural ambassador for mm -hmm, them mm -hmm. um, and say, I want you to listen to this and take the story away mm -hmm. from it. I can't be a legitimate, authentic performer of this mm -hmm. story. And, you know, there are, there are some stories that I just won't tell because I think the, the cultures from which they come are very concerned about cultural appropriation. And um, it's, not my, it's not my place to tell those stories. It's their place to tell those stories. Um, but, you know, and, and so there's this constant battle back and forth for most times. There, there is the way in which a good story can cross cultural boundaries uh, yeah. more readily than other kinds of information. So yes. because there's something more universal in, in the characters in that story. Uh, I, I have a question here from Joanna, and I, I wanted to thank Joanna Smith, who's part of our uh, wider community of support here. This is a question coming in from Joanna. Uh, do you have some reflections on the similarities and differences between oral and textual storing, storytelling? What is gained or lost in our shift away from oral storytelling toward textual storytelling? Because you seem to, to relish particularly the oral storytelling, but many of us approach stories through a, a text that we read. 
And can that take us into the zone? I, I call it the zone, you know, we use yeah. that in basketball. He's in the zone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a good storyteller, can that carry you into the zone textually as well as orally? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, just about anything can. I mean, work can get you into the zone, right? Um, uh, Mahai Chiksent Mahai has done some wonderful work with what he calls flow and, the, and peak experiences. Um, and he, he's done work with, uh, with athletes and, and researchers and, and all sorts of different folks to say, you know, what is the experience like to be in peak performance? And it's, it's stage five of my model, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So the, yes, I think, I think reading definitely does this. Um, I've had the experience myself, so I know it exists for me personally. Um, whereby you're, you're reading a book and you don't hear the telephone, you don't hear your kids screaming, you don't hear anything, you're just lost in the story. And there's an entire book by Victor Nell called Lost in a Book um, about the psychology of the experience of reading. Um, so yes, absolutely, it can happen. I think what, what I would say though, is that the induction process is going to be somewhat different. Mm -hmm. The end result may be very similar. Um, in terms of the, the phenomenological experience of that altered state of consciousness may be very similar. And those the, the sort of things that I was able to tease out in story listening were things like um, a deep sense of realism, um, a sense of time distortion, that it can go faster or slower than your normal um, sort of objective sense of time or subjective sense of time. Um, so there are characteristics of this altered state that I think are probably fairly similar across the different modalities, but how you induce that state and what channels are available to you, what communication channels are available to you are very different because the text relies on a distant author. Um, it isn't, um, it isn't uh, improvisational um, in the sense that the text isn't gonna change based on your feedback or your confusion or anything else. Um, so it's much more of a fixed modality than, uh, than storytelling is. Mm -hmm. uh, but storytelling can be that too. There are storytellers who give sort of dramatic monologues and they're memorized. There's yeah. no improvisation much at all. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a different approach to um, how to get people involved in, in what you do. And there are techniques for the authors as well. Um, you know, the, the plot structures, the, the story arc that they talk about, mm -hmm. um, all of those design features uh, that authors consider, how much information do I give a reader? When do I give that information to the reader? All of those decisions are, are geared about around trying to immerse them in this story narrative world. This is what is called a secondary world by, by Tolkien and others. So I, I would just note that as you were describing what a storyteller does and engages with the audience and, and uses the eyes, how much this is part of what a great teacher does too. I, I just want to point out we have teachers here with us and, and you know, this is one of the great challenges of Zoom when we can't see people. It's like, how am I connecting with people? It, it's just a bizarre aside, I'll point out that a great teacher is like a great storyteller. But but let me come up with another question. This is from Jonathan about the line between fact and fantasy. Um, if I write a story and say this is a story once upon a time, but what if I frame it a different way? This is based on a true story. I, I say this as a historian, okay? And I tell stories like, but they're based on, it's a true story. You know, um, this person went and fought in this war and lost his best friend. And you can pull people in with history as well, is there a difference between fact and fiction that makes the power of the story different? Or can you evoke the same emotional response with a historically factual story as you make with a, another kind of story? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, it goes to all sorts of things from misinformation to disinformation uh, in our current world. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it has huge ramifications. Um, I know there was, uh, I think there was a, 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 an author who wrote a, a book and said it was autobiographical and it turns out it wasn't. And there was this huge furor about it. I can't remember the title at the moment. Um, but no, I, I think it is absolutely possible to do um, history as story. In fact, I think it's much more memorable and much more interesting when it is given as story rather than as fact. The, the dilemma I think comes 
where as an historian or someone who is really wedded to and dedicated to keeping the historical record accurate, um, as you storify something, um, you go from history to fiction and in between is that historical fiction or fictional history. Mm -hmm. And that's the blurry part where um, I think it becomes or can become problematic as we yeah. storify uh, the history. So, um, you know, I, I mean, a fair amount of history we have to storify because we don't have documents to, to mm -hmm. justify and, and, and data to, to work with. So we have to sort of flesh in the, or fill in the, the gaps that we have. Um, but I have, I have heard history professors um, who are just phenomenal storytellers. Mm -hmm. And I have had history professors in high school who um, were fact givers. And I yeah. can tell you that the history professors who tell stories are way better <laughs> in terms of my memory and in terms of um, engagement. Uh, this is a big issue with uh, with film, historical films as well. You know, do you yeah. take a historical uh, event and then make it into a story for a movie? You know, um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you one one final uh, question. Uh, you know, about culture and storytelling. People often say certain cultures are really known for storytelling. For example, Southern culture is often described as a storytelling culture. And I, I have a good friend who tells amazing stories and everybody at the dinner table is just like transported. And he's a, a guy from Georgia. He tells all his deep Georgia voice. Do you think some cultures celebrate storytelling more than others or is it embedded in every culture? I think it's embedded in every culture. <laughs> <clears throat> I really do. I think I think stories uh, and folklore um, are pretty much universal. Um, I think we all have a need for um, narratives that deal with life circumstances and help us understand and make sense of the world. If you look at a lot of the folk literature, um, it's what they what the French call a pourquoi tale, um, a tale about why the world is the way it is, and. Um, I challenge my storytelling students with, I don't usually do this with children because it, it confuses them, but with adults, I like to say, but think about our current science. It's a story, it's an ongoing story. Mm -hmm. And you know, the story that we tell now, a hundred years from now may just be ludicrous based on what we then know. And so to say that science is fact or that you know, these things are fact, I have a little trouble with that um, on, on my own personal level, because I think that you know, we're, we're constantly learning and our stories about why things are the way they are, are constantly mm -hmm. changing. Um, so I think everything is story, which, is, which makes my life wonderful because as a storyteller, I have uh, the whole world as fodder. <laughs> That's right. Although, as a historian, I will say we still need some facts because we get a lot yes, of fake do. news in this world. Yes, That's we do. Problem. Yep. But I appreciate you. You've launched our discussion of escape and, and storytelling and magical reality by reminding us that the story of escape is also a story of coming back to some part of yourself, yes. right? Because the most effective story, no matter how distant or remote it might take you, also brings you back to something within you that speaks to you. It does, person. it does. And that's that's the power, right? I yeah. mean, the real power behind the storytelling. I mean, you've got all of these tips and techniques and things that you can use that we've been talking about here. But the true power is when the listener brings personal experiences, memories, and all of those things. And the story mm -hmm. forms a bond with those memories and excites those memories and brings the, the, the listener into a new state of awareness. So um, that when you tell the story and somebody breaks into tears, in the end, you find out they just broke up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend. So, oh, I would uh, something right. in this story spoke to that experience in your own self. So. That's right. And if and let me put in one last plug. If yeah. I can. Um, if if you would like to see this in action, captured cinema uh, in cinematography. Um, if you have never seen the Princess Bride movie. Yeah. Um, it's a fabulous movie, and if you watch the first 10 minutes of it, you will see this story listening trance take into effect. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll see it going from the real world to the narrative world, 
losing touch with the narrative world as the uh, narrator, actually the voice of the narrator, Peter Falk disappears and the characters begin to speak entirely. And then partway through the movie, the little boy pops back out and they come back. I mean, you can see these models played out in The Princess Bride beautifully. All right, there's a recommendation, folks, a movie for you to check out. That's Brian, right. thanks so much. We'll come back to you also in the panel, but you've raised a lot of important issues. Let me uh, explain to everyone, we're going to take a 15-minute break now, stretch your legs, take a break, and we will resume with uh, Eliza Rose in a few minutes, and we're going to talk about Ursula Le Guin and uh, science fiction. So thank you, Brian, and thanks to all of you, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you for having me. Thank you.